The Property Pod. 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 Welcome to The Property Pod with MoneyWeb. The property sector is an ever-changing sector. And in this podcast series, your host, Suren Naidu, chats to movers and shakers in the property industry. Hello and welcome to The Property Pod, South Africa's premier property investor podcast. My name is Suren Naidu. And on this weekly podcast show, we gain insider insights from leading executives, analysts, developers, and entrepreneurs in South Africa's expansive property industry. The office property sector in South Africa and worldwide is largely in the doldrums as COVID-19 accelerated the work from home and now remote working phenomenon. But many companies have pushed for staff to come back to the office even if it's just for a few days in the week. The sector, however, is improving from the COVID fallout at least. You guessed it, we are speaking about the office property sector on the latest podcast. Joining me on the line is Eileen Andrew, Vice President of MSCI in South Africa, which provides data and economic research to various sectors of the economy and businesses. Industries include the property sector. A very warm welcome to the property pod, Eileen. Thanks, Siren. Thank you very much for having me here. MSCI covers mainly the commercial property sector in terms of research um, on the property sector and does quite a bit of work with the likes of SAPOA, which is the South African Property Owners Association and the Green Building Council. And that includes the SAPOA quarterly office uh, vacancy survey. Office is the worst performing sector, unfortunately, still for uh, subsector, as it were, in the broader commercial space. But things are improving according to the latest report, and that's for the quarter three of 2023. Can you share a little bit more insights from that latest report that you've done? Yes, certainly, um, Siren. So you're quite right. Office, the office sector has struggled, and it's probably compared to the other sectors, which includes a residential um, or a institutional residential sector. Offices have given investors sort of the bottom returns when we compare to the other sectors. And the fundamentals, so when we look at fundamentals, we look at things like vacancy and net income growth. Um, rental growth numbers, those have sort of been weakest within the office sector coming up to this previous quarter. Um, And that's largely driven by low demand within the office sector and an oversupply of offices. Um, We are starting to see vacancy numbers move a little bit. So we have seen them come down marginally in this last quarter. Um, A lot of that has got to do with vacancy take-up, particularly in the prime office space. So within certain nodes, that prime office space is still in demand as tenants are moving into office space where um, it sort of is more fit for purpose. So maybe not leasing as many square meters as they were previously, but as they sort of reconfigure and come to a new understanding of what they want their office space to look like, moving into that prime office space. So that's we're starting to see, that's sort of driving office vacancies down marginally, but we're not seeing the dial move as much as what we'd like it to move, certainly yet. And then just to highlight some of the stats from that side, from vacancies, because it peaked. Uh, I know Santon was a special case, but there's a lot happening in the office property sector with the conversions uh, to residential, for example. You know, I stay in Sunning Hill, and Sunning Hill, half of Sunning Hill is now converted to residential, including the PWC building. Perhaps you want to highlight some of the, the local percentage from a vacancy perspective compared to, say, maybe, um, you know, that COVID peak of maybe 2020? So I think we saw vacancies peak at right about 22, 23%. And that was really just post-COVID. Um, we've seen that number come off to around about 15% now. So we are seeing take up, but there's obviously a lot of dispersion across different nodes. So there are some nodes where we see vacancies much lower than that. You know, and we, know we, we often think Joburg only, but if we look across to the Cape, nodes like Cavendish vacancies are particularly low. Um, If we take the Schlanger node in Durban, 
also very, very low vacancy, so very high demand in certain locations. And maybe that's because there, there's been a restraint on the supply in those locations. Where we've seen oversupply or a lot of buildings sort of happening in 2015, 16, 17, and I speak particularly on Santon, we see higher vacancies. So, um, you know, while we can sort of look at uh, overall South African vacancy rate, we do need to just be cognizant of different nodes perform differently. And so, no, maybe not everybody is the same. Thanks for that, uh, Eileen. Uh, COVID and work from home or hybrid working uh, have changed the face of office property, not just in South Africa, but worldwide. What are your thoughts on this? How serious an impact is it having on the office property sector? Yeah, certainly. And, and MSCI operates in you know globally, so we look at 33 countries across the world. So it's very interesting to see what's happening in the US and across Europe and the UK and so on. And certainly in the US, this work from home has impacted the office space drastically, particularly in the big global cities, places like New York and Chicago. Those old CBD offices, or not old CBD offices, but those sort of traditional CBD hubs have been severely impacted by covid Um, and a work from home scenario and they haven't the the return back to the office hasn't played out yet so there's still what it's done for suburban offices though is it's sort of boomed the suburban office market so you know you get winners and losers in whatever happens in the south african case um, we certainly have seen um, a work from home phenomenon come into south africa it's undeniably there But I sort of feel like it's unwinding slowly but surely. And one of the things that is unwinding it is load shedding. You know, when you're in your office, you have sustainability of electricity. You know, you're not going to get interrupted your Wi-Fi connection. You're able to charge your laptop and continue to work. And so things like that are are maybe making South Africa a little bit different from the rest of the world. And, um, you know, when we talk to a lot of our clients and a lot of the big corporates, um, a lot of the big owners of property, You know, we started off by saying three days a week was where things were settling. Then we started hearing four days a week if there were things are starting to settle now. So I I think we are we're different from the rest of the world. And I do think we're starting to see office workers make their way back into offices in South Africa. Well, I spoke to the Santon Central Management District and you certainly see that in Santon with the traffic levels compared to, you know, like even a year ago. Getting back to the office, the topic of that, I thought it was quite interesting. I was at the Springbok World Cup winning tour uh, of Joburg CBD. We were actually at uh, FNB Bank City last week. uh, And the FNB CEO, uh, Jacques Saliers, even joked uh, to the crowd that, uh, you know, things like that are getting people to come to the office. Obviously, that was just a joke. But is the work from home trend set to continue and, you know, you mentioned corporates cutting down on space, but reevaluating and deciding, you know, to go into that prime. I have a question around green building and ESG towards the end of our interview, but uh, things like remote working is becoming uh, even quite topical and, you know, cities like Cape Town are benefiting from it. So, yeah, I mean, we are benefiting from, uh, there is benefits to remote working. If you think about traffic, you can move around more easily. You don't necessarily need to be in the office in a space to do a certain job. Um, But I suppose the other flip side of that, and a lot of what we're hearing is around productivity. Are your workers as productive outside of the office as as would they be in the office? And I think that's the thing that big corporates are struggling with, is they may be starting to see productivity levels declining, and that's why they need guys to come back into the office you know, a lot of the, the softer skills, what you learn from older, more experienced people sitting around you in an office, how do you actually, you, you know, how do you harness that um, in a work from home sort of scenario? So there's a, there's so many different elements to think about. And maybe where that comes into play is re-understanding what an office needs to look like. So if we think about big corporates like F&Bs and Bank City, maybe a very traditional type of office layouts, and maybe we need to rethink about what those offices look like. Certainly when we talk to the guys fitting out new offices, is those spaces look very different from what they looked like um, you know, sort of five years ago, because now you need to make, you know, there needs to be a space where people can have teams calls in a small room where it's quiet without background noise. That didn't exist five years ago. So so reimagining what space needs to look like and understanding what those requirements are is what's changing and, and what corporates are trying to get their heads around. Not so, so not just the number of people that are going to be in the office, but what people need when they're in the office. A whole new ballgame. 
On the office vacancy report, I see one of the comments is that the office sector in South Africa, at least, will need uh, SA GDP growth of uh, around 3% to see a a material impact on uh, vacancies or vacancies drop, as it were. Similar sentiments uh, expressed by the likes of Growth Points, uh, South Africa CEO Estian de Klerk, for a number of years now. Can you perhaps expand a little bit on this from an MSCI side? Yes, certainly. So, I mean, we we track total return, which is your ultimate measure for investment or investors in real estate, um, because we're looking at the growth of the assets value as well as the income stream at the same time. And we correlate that to um, GDP growth. And the two of them work very, very closely together with about a 12 to 18 month lag. And that's because property returns are very much linked to what's happening in the economy because the economy drives demand for space. When you have um, increased GDP growth, there's more money floating around in the system. You're getting new tenants come to market, new businesses coming out. People are demanding space in order to do that work. Um, They're also uh, more willing to sign longer leases and actually commit to more space. So so growth mops up space effectively. Um, And once the space gets mopped up, then we start to see demand and we can start to see rental prices increase on that space as well. Um, The opposite is obviously true as well. So as we see GDP growth start to decline, people tightening their belts or tenants tightening their belts, renegotiating leases downwards in terms of rentals, not needing so much space, uh, maybe making do with a B-grade office when they were in an A-grade office, that sort of thing starts happening. So when we talk about that 3% GDP growth, that's what we're sort of looking backwards at our data, looking at the cycle, so upwards and downwards that we've seen before. The quantum of space, the quantum of space that's out there that needs to be let, we need about three percent of growth to bring enough new tenants into our market to create that demand to mop up that space over time. Because the quantum of space is really, really big at the moment. We're looking at you know, sort of a million square meters of space in Santon alone that needs to be mopped up. That's a lot of new tenants coming into that space. So, you know, while we've been talking about this work from home, that is a problem that we're facing in South Africa, but the lack of growth um, and to Estian's sort of point, the lack of growth that we're seeing has a much bigger impact within our market and will drive demand in our market far more than a work from home scenario, as an example. Just for a little bit more insight, one of the other reports that uh, you bring out is the MSCI South Africa Biannual Property Index. Can you share a little bit of uh, detail around the performance from that perspective, you know, the total returns, as it were, uh, compared to other sectors? Uh, Yes, certainly. So what we, um, MSA, like I said, we measure total return on assets and we break that down into the two pillars, which is income return or return on income and the return on value or, or capital value of the assets. And we bring that out every six months. We republish what that number actually is. Um, and then we look we look at the different sectors and we also look at different types and different locations and so on. In this last six months, offices returned 1%. Um, And if we break that down to an income return and capital growth, capital growth actually moved backwards by 3%. Income return was quite stable at 4.1%. That's a six monthly number. So income return at about 4% is quite normal. Um, But valuations have gone backwards for offices, not only now, but pre-COVID as well. We saw valuations under a huge amount of pressure within the office market. If we compare that to industrial assets, which have been the best performing sector probably for the last six or seven years, they returned a a half-year number of 5.6% to June 2023. And retail has recovered actually really nicely after being hardest hit by COVID, giving investors a return of 4.1% for six months. So retail actually coming back quite strongly. If we look at trading density numbers, which we also track, trading density has actually recovered very, very nicely, particularly in large shopping centers. So in super regional shopping centers, we've seen trading density come back very nicely. Unfortunately, offices, as we've said, are still at the bottom of the pile um, and they continue to be there um, and their income's under pressure, their rentals are under pressure. Thank you for that. Just to conclude, Aileen, talking about returns in the office sector with the the next UN COP28 climate change summit taking place in Dubai from the end of this month to to around mid-December, how are we, uh, South Africa that is, 
progressing on the green building front. I interviewed the Green Building Council before, but clearly climate change is a key part of the property sector's discussions around ESG and green buildings. You know, uh, the MSCI and, and the Green Building Council have a partnership where they track the performance of green buildings. And historically, or the last few reports say that green buildings boast higher returns. Can you share a little bit more insight on that to conclude? Certainly, certainly. So, I mean, green buildings has become key within any investor or property investor's sort of scope that they need to be thinking about. And that's primarily because green buildings are the heaviest weighted um, items. So they have the highest materiality in the E of your ESG pillar for a real estate company. So it's the thing they need to think about most. So what MSCI has done with the Green Building Council over the last sort of six years is we have been measuring whether the total return that comes off of a green certified building is better than that comes off a non-green certified office building. And in actual fact, consistently for the last seven years, it has given a better return. And that's really because your risk within the tenant or your tenant's risk is much lower in a green certified building because that tenant that occupies or demands green certified space is generally a blue chip tenant. So your income risk is lower, which means you get a better valuation on that building um, and you generally have lower vacancies, better income growth. You know, all those kind of fundamentals that we look at in property all the time are better on that green certified building um, and therefore give you a better a risk profile on the building as such. So that's very, very nice to see. And I think that gives, within your ESG rating, there's a huge amount of comfort there using a heavier weighting or in your materiality when you're looking at a green buildings. Um, I think the other thing that we're also starting to look at more and more and going forward is we traditionally were measuring offices only because that's where green building certification started. But more and more property owners are looking across the spectrum of buildings um, or property types, and we've started seeing green certifications come out for industrial. We've seen shopping centers with green certifications now. So we're not limited only to offices. We're looking across the scope um, around certifications to ensure that we're looking, you know, climate risk is being thought about across the whole spectrum. Well, it comes in handy, especially with our local situation in South Africa, load shedding and now water issues becoming a big thing. So there has been a tremendous amount of savings, particularly on the water side. But, you know, there is this big drive around solar, but other areas in the ESG space, particularly with the property industry. Do you have any concluding thoughts on that? Certainly. So in this year, I would say our biggest um, conversation with our clients um, in, across Europe has been around climate risk. So how do you assess climate risk? How do you measure climate risk and then mitigate for climate risk within a building? Um, and a lot of that comes from legislation across Europe and in the UK and in the US, um, less legislated in South Africa. But as you say, we've sort of been kicked into action by load shedding. So maybe the silver lining that's come with load shedding is we've seen huge amounts of capital being allocated to renewable energy sources within um, our local market, which has a knock-on effect for climate risk. So we've actually de we're starting to de-risk our buildings from a climate perspective because of load shedding and certainly because of water shedding as well. So, you know, we're sort of starting to get our heads around how we do that from an electricity perspective, but now we're starting to think about that from a water perspective as well. Um, so maybe some of these issues that we face within our market um, have actually going to have a silver lining and that silver lining is going to be reduction in climate risk going forward. Eileen, thanks so much for your time. That was Eileen Andrew, Vice President of MSCI South Africa. Thanks for listening to the MoneyWeb Property Pod with Suren Naidu. To listen to more episodes, go to moneyweb.co.za or the MoneyWeb app and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates. Follow Suren on Twitter at Suren Naidu for more of his property industry content and other business stories. Pod. Pod. Pod.